twenties, a time of glitz, glamour, rebellion, alcohol, and witches. Wait, what? Hello and welcome back to Director in the Making, aka me, Veronica, and today we'll be talking about the murder case that shocked 1920s Royal Pennsylvania and changed everyone's, or at least the people of that time's, concept of witches. In what is now Spring Valley Park in York, Pennsylvania, sits a two-story house. This old wooden house was once owned by Nelson Ramir. Ramir was a farmer as well as a powwow doctor. Ramir practiced Pennsylvania Dutch powwow, which is similar but different from Native American powwow. According to Learn Religions, Pennsylvania Dutch powwow is a blend of folk magic, healing remedies, and Christian theology, while Native American practice of powwow is a social event bringing together people of different backgrounds for celebrations, rituals, song, and dance. The PA Dutch folk magic uses charms and spells for protection and healing. People who perform these rituals are known as powwow doctors. Much of the practice is rooted in the book The Long Lost Friend by German author John George Homan in 1820. Obviously, Ramir wasn't the only one in that area practicing the religion of powwow. John Blymeyer was another local who followed this religion. Blymeyer was down on his luck lately. His wife left him, he lost two of his children, and he was struggling to find a job. Really baffled by his misfortune, Blymeyer turned to Nellie Knoll, aka the River Witch of Marionetta. At the time, Nellie Knoll was an elderly woman and a well-known powwower in the area. Once Blymeyer got there, she placed a single dollar bill onto his palm and told him that once she removed the dollar bill, all the key to his problems would be revealed. He would see what is causing his issues. So once she removed the bill from his hand, he claimed to have seen Nelson Ramir. Coincidentally, Ramir had also been unlucky recently. His wife also left him after she thought he was becoming too obsessed with white magic. She packed up her things and her, their two daughters and left. Blymeyer was convinced that Raymere had cursed him with a similar fate. Noel constructed Blymeyer to steal Raymere's copy of The Long Lost Friend and burn it. He was also told to cut a lock of Raymere's hair and bury it six feet under the ground. After these two tasks were complete, then the curse would be lifted. Researching this, I saw many redition. <laughs> While I was researching this, I saw many redition. Renditions. Renditions. While researching this, I saw many reditions. While researching this, I saw many renditions of this story. And this part always kind of changed and flip-flopped. It was either he had to get the long lost friend book and burn it, or bury a lock of his hair, or burn both the long lost friend and the lock of hair at the same time and bury the ashes or <laughs> they only said one or the other like either way he had to do one of these tasks book and hair that's all the man was told to do and the curse would be lifted keep that in mind later to help him with his task Blymeyer recruited two teenagers John Curry who was 14 at the time and Wilbert Hess who was 18 why he just immediately was like hey, I need some buddies to help me and decide to pick a 14 year old and 18 year old. I don't know. Probably because the other people would have looked at him like he's nuts. I, I don't know, but he picked these children to come help him. On Thanksgiving Eve, 1928, the trio arrives at Raymere's house. Raymere welcomed them into his home without knowing what their scheme was. Blymeyer demanded to have Raymere's copy of the book. And obviously he refused to give it to him. Don't know why he couldn't have just had the boys distract him and then grab it. He wasn't really thinking that far ahead. I don't know. Really just wasn't thinking. That's just the moral of this story. The man wasn't thinking. Blymeyer and the two boys tied up Raymere and beat him to death. They then doused him in kerosene and set him on fire. Because, you know, that's what the river witch of Marionetta told you to do. It was in between the lines of steal his book or cut his hair. And for some reason in his mind, and I guess the boys with the fact that they killed the man 
who supposedly cursed him, supposedly, the curse was now lifted. With my understanding, my little understanding, I am not an expert in these things, but with my little understanding of how these like magic things work, that does not get rid of the curse, especially since you didn't, you didn't listen <laughs> to the other witch. She told you two ways to get out of this. You did not do either of those ways. So the curse is not lifted. You just killed a man for no reason. As you can tell from this point on, their lives get worse. The next day, Ramir's body is found by his neighbors after they realize his animals on his farm have not been fed. Oddly enough, Ramir and the house didn't burn completely. Like it didn't go down. And this is an old wooden house, but just, nope, did not burn down. His neighbors didn't even notice there was a fire until they got inside. It is believed that Raymir was not quite dead when Blymere left um, and was somehow able to put out the fire. Some theorize that he did it with his own magical abilities. And the only thing in the house that was able, that was actually charred was his body and uh, the floorboards that surrounded him. And that was it. Everything else was intact. With the evidence of the crime left behind, the police were able to arrest Blymire and his two young accomplices. The three stood trial for Ramir's murder and were found guilty, obviously. They were all sentenced to life in prison, but were then later given parole. The three men went on to live their normal lives. The Hex House is still standing today frozen in time. Everything, including the charred floorboards where Mar Ramir had his last moments, and the clock above the stove that still reads 1201, the time of the murder, is still there. Ramir's great-grandson, Ricky Ebaugh, now owns the property and may still do tours of the home today, but I'm not quite sure because I did read something that since COVID happened, they stopped it for obvious reasons. Um, so I'm not quite sure. You might have to look up to see that. I couldn't quite find anything that said that they still did tours, but the house is still there. You just can't go inside and don't even try to break in. There is a bunch of cameras around, so you're going to get caught. Just don't try it. Also, like, why would you want to break in? It's interesting to go see legally, but it's not that interesting to go see illegally. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> There's also a documentary on this tragic event. If you would wish to get more information about that, I would go watch it. So thank you for watching. I hope you liked this video. I hope it was entertaining. You got to learn some new things and got you in the spooky mood because spooky season is here. Make sure to like the video if you liked it. Make sure to subscribe. If you subscribe, maybe one of these days you will see a video where I am able to actually speak English completely <laughs> instead of messing up all the time. Subscribe for that because maybe one day we'll get to that point and I want you to be on this journey with me, okay? Like, subscribe, and comment below any other urban legends slash crime spooky stuff that you want me to learn about, research, and do a video about. I will see you guys next time in another video of mine. Cut. That's a wrap.